these. Um, having a positive and supportive connection with others. To me, that's community, right? Having options, having solutions, getting information, motivation, sharing, and finding out what's working for other people. Companionship, encouragement, hope, advice of all kinds. There was all kinds of advice that y'all wanted. Uh, positive support to meet people. Uh, other people with MS to hear other stories. Uh, isn't that what a, com a community is all about? And someone wrote to leave no stone unturned. I love that. And that's what I want to do. This is not a Terry, what supplement do I take for this? You know what? This is going to be so much uh, deeper and wider and richer than that. That's, that's my goal. Okay. So my goal is to engage you in, in all levels of healing. And I want you to understand what healing is because nobody talks about that, do they? Does it, has anybody actually talked to you about what's going on in MS? I, well, of course I haven't seen a neurologist for about 32 years, but, uh, nobody ever talked to me about it back then. Uh, I had to go figure that all out by myself. Now I teach other doctors what's actually going on in MS. Um, I'm good. I've got, I pulled out some slides for you um, today. I, I want to, we want to know about healing. We want to know what is MS. We want to know why this is such a freaking exciting time to be diagnosed with MS. Now I've been called out on that statement a million times, trust me. And Every time I am, I think about it and I think, no, this is an exciting time to be diagnosed with MS. I didn't say it was exciting to be diagnosed with MS and that's not so exciting. But if there was a time in history to be diagnosed with it, it's now because even 20, even well, jeepers, even when I was diagnosed, when I was diagnosed, they did my MRI and sent me home to get my affairs in order. How long ago? That would have been 36 years ago. You know, there was like, it was like, don't think about going out in the community. Don't think about driving a car. Don't think about any of the things that I do very, very regularly and easily now. Good news is I was a cheeky 25 year old. I didn't really know what it meant when they said, go home and get your affairs in order. So I just kept living a good life. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a slide here. I'm gonna to talk to it because I made this slide up and I love this slide because this is what I think is going on right now. And yes, I'm a licensed naturopathic doctor. I need to tell you that I am, my training comes, it's so rich and wonderful from some of the, the most traditional naturopathic doctors. Um, Belgium and France and Germany and in, in the United States. So I, natural medicine is totally my bag. That's what I do. In more recent years, I have certified as a functional medicine practitioner. Functional medicine is a new perspective on the current medical model. And what I love about it is that this is, med this is a group of medical doctors who've said, have looked at, they've been, the guys that started this have been medical doctors for like 50 years. And they've kind of looking at it going, ah, this isn't working so well, is it? You know, people are fatter and sicker than they've ever been. There's got to be another way. So, oh, guess what? This group of doctors is talking about nutrition, is talking about lifestyle is talking about a lot of things that actually run really nicely in parallel um, with naturopathic medicine. They don't have the philosophy and the understanding of healing. They still come at it from a medical, as a medical model that way, but it's an evolving and changing medical model. And then there's the new science. And I got to tell you, if I could take a sabbatical right now and just go off and study the new things that have happened in neuroscience in the last five and 10 years, I would totally do that. Actually, in the last 20 years, the base of knowledge in um, neuroscience has doubled. Like that's crazy. Like it, it takes 50 
a hundred, 200 years for that to happen, not 20 years. So there's a lot going on that directly impacts uh, people with MS. So this is my little, my little image to say there is limitless potential. When those three things collide, which they are right now, there's limitless, poss- limit, limitless possibility. Um, but it brings us to the next issue, which is something I call the therapeutic gap. So I'm going just to talk to you about this. So I, I see that pretty picture of that great big gap there with the bridge over top, over top of it. I want to get back to you live, but that therapeutic gap is all of those things are coming together. And if your neurologist isn't as excited as I am about all of this stuff, it's because it takes a long time to uh, get that information, new science and emerging models uh, to come into the medical practice. So there's lots of data out there that say, our medical doctors nowadays, and God love them for what they do. Um, it it they practice today what they learned in when they went to school, and that's that's just that's in the data. So if your doctor is twenty years, uh, twenty years, or thirty years, or forty years in practice, you know they're they're practicing what they learned. They don't have time to sit and read journal articles. Heck, I don't really have time. I make time. I carve it out of my um, my day. So that therapeutic gap is putting us in a position where sometimes the patients actually do know more than the doctors because they're following the current research. So that gets kind of awkward. I get it. So uh, I often uh, coach people in how to um, navigate the, the speaking to their neurologists or their doctors uh, in light of all that. Now, this slide, I made this slide in 1998, the one I'm about to show you. This is one that I want you to remember. This is what I call the pyramid of healing. The, the tip of that, which is the physical, that's what we feel every day. That's those, the pain in those feet, that's the dizziness, that's the, you know, heavy legs, the physicality of what's going on in your body. But there's a whole lot of functional stuff going on, metabolic things, uh, where the body just keeps adapting because that's what the body does. The body is a master adapter and the body adapts and it adapts and it adapts until it just can't adapt anymore. And that's when the physical symptoms happen. Okay. So that functional layer is almost invisible because we haven't been trained how to, how to deal there. We've, we've been, we've been all raised in the culture that says, got a headache, take a pill, you know, Oh, what have you got for this? What have you got for that? Instead of saying, Hmm, what's going on here? The next layer down is the psychological layer. And then beyond that, the energetic and spiritual layer. And those are the two layers that I didn't get for so, so long. But now this is where the, um, the new neuroscience is just, you know, blowing my mind because that is the mind body connection, that psychological layer and the energetic or spiritual layer, because you don't have to be religious. I'm not asking you to be religious, but there is an intelligence in this world. There is an intelligence in your body that is big, that is bigger than, you know, that brain between our ears. And this is not my opinion. This is not, this is what neuroscience is telling us now. Love it. Love it. And we're going to talk a lot more about that as, as time goes on, because that is so awkward for us, right? When, I mean, who, who separated the mind from the body? That was Descartes. How many, how many years ago? And what they used to say was 
and I'm sure some still believe that the mind is a function of the brain. And if that is broken, then let's give it some drugs and let's fix it. But now we know that it's much, 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 much more than that so in my, pr in my private practice, you know, and, and I, you know, I don't put people on the spot, but sometimes I'll just sort of gently ask them, why, why do you think you have MS or, uh, you know, when we're talking about a particular conflict or a particular emotional trauma, sort of just sort of say, do you think that might have something to do with this? And, and you know, what blows me away is the answer is always definitive. It's always like, oh yeah. So people know they just need to, to have a little nudging to, uh, to get there. So we've got physical, we, oops, holy, let me show you the, the, that slide again. We've got the physical, which is the tip of the iceberg, which are, are the symptoms. We've got the functional, which is, which is where the body is struggling to adapt to changes that are actually happening. And then we've got the psychological and the energetic or spirit. So that's one, you know what? I'll post this one. Will you, will you remind me to post this one? I'll post this one in the group because this slide has served me really well for how many years since 1998? I have to take my shoes and socks off to count that, but, and I hope it will serve you too. And, uh, and I hope actually, you know what? I'll post all of these slides individually because I chose them for tonight's, um, conversation. So they, I want you to understand a bit more about healing instead of going for the, oh, what can I take? What can I take? What can I take? You know, because it's not about that. Healing is not about what you take. It's not one thing. It's not even two things. It's about everything that you do. We know now from epigenetics that every part of your environment plays a role in switching genes on and off. In, in a good way, you know, so switching the bad genes on and the good genes on. So this is, this is all part of that. And all that to say that this is a journey, right? It's not a one and done, let's fix it forever kind of thing. I want you to think of this too, right? So if Mike always refers when he's talking to people of getting you from the left side of the page to the right side of the page. So on the left side of the page, this is where, you know, if you're, if you're newly diagnosed with MS, you're shocked, you might be afraid, you, you're reluctant to change. You're like, why do I have to do that? And what we want to do is explore all of the things that we're exploring today, how new science changes things for the better, how to assess and address what's going on for you and, and your choices and your options. And for me, that's a really important part. Like I want you to be able to say, okay, so I'm a little bit dizzy or so the pain's gone up or so I don't need to call my neurologist's office and say, oh my God, what do I need? I know that, oh yeah, I had that pizza last night at that birthday party. And then I ran that marathon and I'm probably inflamed and I probably need to get things under control again. So that kind of health confidence is where I really want you to want to be able to take you. That's one of my, um, objectives. So you explore, then you engage, you actually, uh, create new beliefs, you create new di diets and lifestyle, and you, you establish abiding self-care. We're going to talk lots about self-care. Self-care for me is the, is the stuff that makes everything else work. Um, and you're serious and you're all in, you know, uh, a lot of the times it's simply about getting to the starting line because it's a big commitment, isn't it? The rest of your life, big commitment, right? After you are engaged, that's when you start to see yourself thrive. You have a great team. You're connected with community. You're connected with great people. Um, you use your tools expertly. You're resilient in the face of challenge instead of collapsing and letting stress get the best of you and your life and future look bright instead of dim, right? And that's when you're rising above the diagnosis. That's when you feel confident and in control and 
you participate in a great life and self-compassion and that's that's a huge thing and um we're going to do all kinds of work on that that's why we're here that's why we're here and there's um somebody called Kristen neff she's a phd in self-compassion believe it or not and that's n-e-f-f and you can check her out on youtube and and get uh get started on that self-compassion if you're not already there Here's my next slide for you. The first triangle, the red triangle, is what's going on in our body. What is at the basis of disease? So inflammation, detoxification and elimination, and good metabolic function. And those three things apply in every system, every single system. And then the purple or blue triangle those are the therapeutic interventions that we can use once again um, to mitigate disease, right? Nutrition, always. Uh, lifestyle and self-care, always. Uh, and then supportive and corrective therapeutics. But I tell you something, uh, and the people that know me already out there from private practice know that nutrition, self-care lifestyle are always the first things I talk to people about. Always, always, always. Uh, because it doesn't matter what you take if you're eating a lousy diet or you're sitting and watching Netflix all day and you don't move. So I can't uh, prescribe corrective and therapeutic, um, supportive and, and corrective therapeutics over a bad diet or over a bad lifestyle. It, once again, it's an all in thing. Okay. So now this is something, this is my new model. This is brand new. And this is the way I see it after 36 years of living with MS and 20 years of being a doctor and how I see it now with my transform MS approach. There is that big layer at the top called the MS mindset reset. And this is right off the bat, we need to address that, that, um, brain body connection, that mind body connection, because it permeates every one of those pillars that's there. The four pillars themselves are self-care. What's self-care? Self-care is everything from self-compassion to sleeping habits to, uh, whether you get a massage once a month, um, uh, we're going to talk about some self-care that I prescribe frequently, like castor oil packs and dry skin brushing. Uh, maybe it's music, listening to music. Whatever self-care will take you out of the stress response and actually help mobilize your body to heal. Movement. What can I say? I've been a, a student of movement all my life. I did a lot of ballet when I was younger and maybe that's it. I don't know. I've always been active and I've always worked with movement therapists in some weight, shape or form. And I'm fascinated by them. I'm absolutely fascinated by how the body moves and how the body continues to move, how the body reestablishes movement. And it is so wise that intelligence that I was talking about inside the body is really, really present when it comes to moving the body. Food and digestion, food and digestion, well, that just can go on forever, right? The gut brain connection, the microbiome, digestion in general, morbidities like Crohn's disease, or celiac disease, which happen very, very, very frequently with multiple sclerosis. We know now that the gut is the epicenter for managing multiple sclerosis. You know, if you have any digestive disorders, if you have any, any level of constipation, remember in the triangle diagram, detoxification and elimination, the first way the body eliminates is through having bowel movements. And if your bowels are moving any less than once a day, then there's a problem. And people say, oh, it's always been like this. Well, no, well, that doesn't make it. That doesn't make it good. And it doesn't make it right. There we go. I put food and digestion 
in the same pillar because they go in the same pillar because you know food can work for you or food can absolutely work against you uh, you know it's every bite you take can be directing your recovery and it can't be understated o- over the years i i have I've had people that do really well and they get to a point and then they absolutely plateau. And it's so like, okay, well, let's revisit what's with some of these pillars, right? I've called them different things over the years. Um, how, how are you doing with your diet? How are you doing with food? How are you doing with your diet? Oh, spot on from Monday to Friday. But on the weekend, I let her rip, you know? And it's like, no, can't do that. Um... So food is important. I literally from one meal to the next. And then the very last one is the, that mind body connection. And it's super important to understand that. And, and this is once again, this isn't flaky stuff anymore. This is like, this is real life science now. And, um, every from the work of Candace Pert, P E R T or Bruce Lipton, we know that every tissue in the body has receptors for every thought we think and every emotion we emote. So if you're a negative Nelly and you know, the grass is always greener somewhere else, then that's being reflected in your tissue. If you're having a bad day, that's being reflected in your tissue. If somebody comes in and brings their emotional garbage in and dumps it all over you, that affects your tissues. We've probably all had the experience where in a very stressful situation, all of a sudden that strength is gone. All of a sudden we're not doing so well. So it's, it's super important to understand that since it was first named in the, in the mid 1800s, um, multiple sclerosis has been a condition that's, that's negatively associated with stress. So that's like closing in on, what is that? It's about 175 years that we've known that MS is directly impacted in a negative way, uh, by stress. So guess what just keeps getting worse? They figured that out in 1840. Compared to today, what kind of stress did they have in 1840? You know what I mean? So imagine what's happening to the body now. So community love is just my way of saying, you know, creating that support structure around you. And I don't mean, I don't mean that in a pathetic way. I mean that in a, in a joyous way. I mean that, uh, you know, what fills you up? Like I said, you guys fill me up. It just took me 15 years to get this going. You know, uh, what fills you up in your life? You know, you don't have to do everything in your life. It doesn't have to be focused on MS. You know, you can do other things and you cannot talk about MS. And, um, at the same time, you can create your support structure. So what does that mean? I'll just give you an example of my support structure. My support structure is from a therapeutic perspective is my naturopathic doctor who I've seen since 1994. Um, my, uh, my osteopath to me, osteopathy is like absolutely essential in, in healing because they just have such an incredible perspective on the body. Um, who else? Martha. Martha absolutely. I've, I have a psychotherapist that I've worked with for years and years and years. She's actually become my clinical supervisor and helps me out with my harder cases uh, at work as well, and but she does marriage counseling. At the same and she time. does marriage counseling if we need it, yeah, right? You gave, right. you gave my thumbs up. Okay, um, so that's part of that. Now, COVID's taken you know taken a kick out of a lot of our community stuff, but you know what? That could be um, uh, going to the gym. That could be going to a book club. Uh, you know what? Whatever builds your community. Uh, and reduce your negative influences at the same time. Yeah, definitely. 
so Mike said, re reducing your negative influences at the same time. So here you go, that, that mindset reset. So that is switching yourself on to the possibility and probability of healing, because we know that that's true. We know through neuroplasticity that the brain can be retrained in its beliefs, which actually change the architecture of the brain. So I just want to go, I want you to see me because think about that. What you believe cha actually physically changes the architecture of your brain. What? It, it helps the brain to rewire around obstructions. Oh, like lesions. So this is all the new neuroscience. We just have to know how to engage it, right? We just have to know how to engage it. Oh, there's Sylvester again. So then there's the pillars and then there's the community love. So the, what's the transform MS blueprint? That is how everything comes together for you to guide you on your, uh, on your unique path. I wanted to talk to you about exactly what MS is. I mentioned this earlier tonight because I'm always shocked that people take stuff. And I don't say it quite with that tone. I'll say, why do you, what do you take that for? And they don't know. That's very trusting of you. Maybe I just have a trust issue. But when you understand the process, then you can understand the things that you can do. What is MS then? It is a process of immune activation and inflammation that plays itself out in the brain and central nervous system. So that process of immune activation and inflammation is what they call autoimmunity. Although when you read the data, even that's in question, but that process of immune activation and inflammation is definitely there. And then it ends up crossing the blood brain barrier and doing damage in the brain. And that's what you and I know as lesions. So what does that mean? Infl you know, immune activation and inflammation. Well, the immune system's main job is to keep you safe. Your immune system's main job is to be tolerant of yourself and intolerant of things like bacteria and viruses and things that it doesn't want in your body. That's, that's what the immune system does. It protects you and it kills that. In now, nowadays, a more modern thinking, like some of the real thought leaders in this are saying it's not that simple, right? It's not that simple. There's a lot of uh, uh, things that happen in our everyday life that mess up that immune activation. So it, it, it's kind of like poking at, at it, you know, like kind of like poking the bear. And so the immune system's kind of going like this and given the right set of circumstances, then guess what? In you and me, it gets uh, directed towards the brain. So you might say, well, what, what are you talking about when you say um, poking the bear? Well, there That's we it. go. Perfect. This is another like million year old slide. So perfect. So these are the type of things that poke the bear or cause that uh, confused, it misdirected immune response that plays itself out in our brain. And I want you to really look at, at some of these because they're fascinating. And the fact that this slide is also a million years old, you know, look at, I, I had beliefs on there. I had trauma on there all those years ago small bowel overgrowth synd syndrome, food, diet, and digestion. That's a million things right there. Inflammation, well, that goes without saying. Grief, emotion, beliefs, trauma, you know, family history, lifestyle, medications can be confusing that immune system. Stress, by all means, mold, and and other chronic latent infections. The, this is a big one. Uh, this is a big one because as far as I can see, 
and I've only been doing it for 20 years, so I might still, I'm still learning. I'm still definitely learning every day, but chronic latent infections are always, always a part of that big multiple sclerosis immune misdirection. What's a latent infection? A latent infection can be Epstein-Barr. Uh, so if you ever had like, a, if you had mono in high school and were in bed for a month or two months or three months or even a week, you know, Epstein-Barr never really goes away. It just gets reactivated and reactivated and reactivated. That's poking that immune system bare. The herpes virus has been directly connected with multiple sclerosis. Mycoplasma pneumonia and chlamydia pneumonia have been, which are both upper respiratory tract uh, bacteria, have have uh, been directly connected with multiple sclerosis. So, especially more recently, I just see that in people. You know, if you've always had sinus infections, or you've, or you catch colds easily, or something. It could be a latent infection with chlamydia pneumonia or mycoplasma pneumonia. Uh, hormone dysregulation, that's a good one too. You think, oh, what's hormones got to do with MS? Well, I tell you, I've, I've got patients who have come to me and I don't see MS when I do their intake. I just see a big hairy hormone mess. And once we clean up that big hormone mess, guess what? Their multiple sclerosis symptoms are a whole lot better, right? Because we're taking that inflammation down. Um, geography, like where you live. Hello, Saskatchewan, right? There's a great big pocket out there of people with MS because of the longitude and latitude. So these are the things that drive that inappropriate immune response that attacks the brain. And these are the things we're going to learn how to manage as we work together. And we're going to put that into our model for healing. And we're just going to make change in our lives, in, in my life, in your life, and in everybody else's life. Because remember, one plus one equals three. And yeah, just like I said, we literally started this last week. I'm so glad we did. I'm so happy to be here. And I just want it to be good for you.